everything felt so spliced, so split, so like they each needed their own room or their own shelf mm -hmm. and that they would be fighting, you know, forever. And every part of you is kind of against itself instead of, oh no, it's actually this whole gorgeous, messy ass mural. And that's you, babe. And I love you, <laughs> right? We're dreaming the world to come, spiraling in time. Dreaming alive, dreaming alive, dreaming the world to come. Dreaming alive, dreaming alive, dreaming the year I told Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm Nomi. And this is Dreaming the World to Come. <laughs> this is Dreaming the World to Come, a project where we reimagine time and the ways we relate to it, aligning with ancestral Jewish traditions and honoring the diverse voices and experiences of the diaspora past present and future, and the magnificent humans who have been dreaming of a just world for millennia. Rebecca and I are both queer, non-binary, white, disabled Jews and Hebrew priestesses or priestesses. We live in the Pacific Northwest on Squaxin land, also known as the Stechas village and known colonially as Olympia, Washington. In addition to the podcast, we created a planner that combines Hebrew, Gregorian, and moon calendars. This year's is called Indwelling Dreams of Alam Haba. The podcast usually comes out at the beginning of each Hebrew month and will include our takes on the month and an interview with a contributor who wrote about that month in the planner. And you really don't need the planner in order to enjoy the podcast. But you can still buy it. We have about 300 left at dreamingtheworldtocome.com, and it's on sale for $18 while supplies last. Get them while they're hot. Get them <laughs> while we're still in 5783. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a Patreon, and we release other, like usually the full interview with the contributor and sometimes other random things we release there throughout the month and you can join for as little as a dollar a month. It's patreon.com slash dreaming the world to come. We appreciate all of your support. Thanks to all our, our patrons. Yeah. Thank you so much for supporting the creation of this podcast and the ASL interpretation. And we really appreciate hearing from you. We've gotten some really nice feedback. Nomi, what are your associations with Nissan this month we're in, we're entering the springtime? This is a big one. This is like, I guess, aside from the high holy days, I feel like this is the season that takes like the most preparation and really kind of consumes me. <laughs> and so, you know, as this podcast is coming out, I'll be thinking about how to transition our kitchen for Passover, which is something I grew up with. My mom would do it, but up until the last few years, I never did it myself. But now we have like extra dishes that we switch out and we like get all of our, you know, the chametz, the leavened breads and things out of the house. Actually, we usually just put it in the garage, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is that you're like, you know, Passover is associated with matzah, with this unleavened bread that baked on the backs of people escaping slavery. And so there's this thing about getting rid of anything that's like puffed up or fluffy in this way of like letting go of any arrogance, letting go of just like anything that is extra added padding on our souls that isn't serving mm -hmm. us. Um, yeah, I love that patting on our souls that isn't serving us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. getting ready for satyrs. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also, it makes me think about matzah. Matzah is so, well, obviously, it's all about matzah. <laughs> matzah is <laughs> so dry. It's like a dry mm -hmm. cracker. So I'm like, oh, well, you don't want your soul to be like 
dry. Yeah. Like, <laughs> dry, know? flaky, cracker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we put all this yummy stuff on it. Corroset and horseradish. <laughs> Butter and salt, my favorite on matzo. <laughs> <laughs> peanut butter and jelly. I remember taking like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on matzo to school and it would be this like soggy, slimy plastic bag full of like oh. seep through all the holes, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember taking that to school too. That was one of the things that we did. We didn't do like a lot of Jewish things, but we, even if we didn't keep Passover the whole time, we symbolically ate matzo. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, this time of year is also the biblical new year. So there are four new years in the Hebrew year. And so for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, it's another time to start anew, which really feels, it really resonates with all the new growth poking out of the ground and starting to grow on the trees. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it took me a while to understand this. Like a lot of people will count the months starting in Nissan. And so they'll say like, you know, Av is the fifth month. And I I would be like, wait, what do you mean? Because the year starts in Tishrei with Rosh Hashanah. But it's been really cool to learn that there's, you know, four different New Year's. And in the Torah, the New Year is in Nissan and is more recent that we started counting by Rosh Hashanah, more recent in the last 2000 years, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> no. So is so is starting the new year in Tishrei with Rosh Hashanah, is that a rabbinical Jewish practice? That is my impression. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we connected Nisan, we're connecting different trees and plants with the Hebrew month, and we connected Nisan with the apple tree. The mm -hmm. apples are usually starting to bloom in the Northern Hemisphere in Nisan. And there's also this Talmudic story that when the Pharaoh made the decree to kill the Israelite babies who were born, that the people with sperm got really Okay, this is not exactly the Talmudic study story. This is a little bit of my interpretation. <laughs> but got really depressed and went out to the orchards. And the people with uteruses seduced them with mirrors to procreate and keep having babies, even though they were scared that their babies would be killed. And, um, and then there is this Talmudic story that the children who were born were raised by the orchards. And mm -hmm. when the Israelites were freed, they all went to the Sea of Reeds and the birds from the apple trees escorted them there and then sang with them through, wow. through the ocean. Wow. So all the hidden babies just grew up in the orchard by themselves raised by trees but then they knew the right time to go join yeah to cross over so the story of the apple orchards is this is kind of a combination of stories from the talmud and from the torah but that it, i don't Yo. think it necessarily was apple orchards actually because i don't know if there were apples in that part of the world at that time mm -hmm. but whatever people are calling apples. <laughs> it was probably apricots. Okay. Mm. But apples have become such a important food for Jewish people. Mm -hmm. um, and that eating apples and using them for Jewish ritual probably actually originated in Spain. Mm. It's interesting because apples are talked about as like such this like very kind of like sexual luscious thing and it makes way more sense that it would be an apricot yeah right because <laughs> they're like fuzzy and like juicy in a different way totally know? they're yeah. very much more sexual than apples <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah for sure i really love the idea of the earth swallowing up the children and caring mm -hmm. for them and that our mythology speaks to our relationship of a trust in the earth 
Mm -hmm. And I feel like in that story that there's Mm -hmm. this really telling of how much we trust that the earth will care for us Mm -hmm. and that the earth does care for us Mm -hmm. and that is us and that we are totally part of the earth. Yeah. Yes. Well, and that makes me think about something I always think about around Passover, around the crossing of the, is it the Red Sea? Or the, the Sea cro- of Reeds. One yeah, of the crossing yeah. of the Sea of Reeds. And, you know, that we see these depictions of Moses, like walking up to the water and being like, part, and then the water's like, Zoop! but like, I, I feel like, you know, Miriam, mm-hmm. Moses' sister was like the water witch like the yeah. the water prophet and i feel like she was tracking the waters tracking the moon it's the full moon okay at this time at this place mm-hmm. the water is going to recede and we will be able to get through in this very narrow window and let's like really trust that let's really trust that let's bring all our stuff let's we'll have to bake the bread on our backs we'll bring our musical instruments so right. that we can celebrate on the other side but like here's how we can leave. And so I feel like Moses and Aaron, I feel like all three of them, these siblings were working together to like, on one hand, kind of put on a show (laughs) and be like, I'm so aligned that I can make this happen. You know, like being aligned with this quest for freedom, being aligned with God. Also like Moses came from privilege because he was raised in the palace by the Pharaoh's daughter. Which and... Miriam totally set the stage for that mm-hmm. to happen. She mm-hmm. put him in the river where she mm-hmm. knew that the Egyptian princess and her maidens would bathe and would find mm-hmm. him. And mm-hmm. she planted the seed that she knew someone who could nurse him, which was his mother. His Yochanan. mother. So and... she got to whisper all her stories to him when he was a baby. Yeah. And yeah. so, like, I feel like Miriam is actually and then she's the one who found the water when we were in the desert and who celebrated Mm -hmm. who was like wow we did that Mm -hmm. like got out her timbrels (laughs) celebrating all these people singing and dancing and she really brought the ruach of the spirit yeah Yeah. and then she was cast out of the community you know because she was sick yeah and that Aaron got ordained into the priesthood but you know there is a a little glitch in the story i don't remember the details of it that kind of leaves us to believe that maybe she also was considered a priestess too Mm -hmm. but you know these stories were written down once patriarchy was more prevalent so we don't really know the real story we just have our memories and intuition Well, obviously she was super powerful because there aren't very many women whose stories and contributions are documented in that way in the Torah. And hers are like, she, you know, found the water everywhere that they went. And she, you know, we know these stories about how she put Moses in the river and introduced Batya to Yocheved. And, you know, I'm sure there's a ton that is left out. Yeah. But the fact that there's that much about her just makes me feel like, oh, she was definitely a priestess. Like, she was definitely considered a priestess in her time. (laughs) Yeah, I think she was, too. And when I think about even, like, the story of Mary Magdalene and Jesus, also, like, I wonder if that's kind of an echo of the Moses Miriam story Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. a way, too. Because Miriam... I feel like Miriam's the star of the show Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that there probably were other powerful priestess women and gender non-conforming people. Mm -hmm. But the reason that Miriam even gets mentioned is because she's supporting Moses. Yeah. You know, so like she's because of where she fits in with that family, she gets any mention at all. Yeah, But that there were probably lots of other people that were doing very powerful things that don't even get a name mention. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
I mean, there were thousands of people, like many thousands of people wandering around together in the desert. So there's this amazing tradition that we have that starts the second night of Passover called Counting the Omer. That's You've done so much work around and created this beautiful divination deck. And I wonder if you'll speak to this tradition of counting the Omer. Yeah. So counting of the Omer is this process of counting the days. I mean, that's the essence of it is just, you're just counting every day between Pesach and Shavuot. So Pesach being the festival of liberation and Shavuot being the festival of revelations. That's like when Moses brought the Torah or, you know, when all Jews who would ever exist and ever had existed were at Sinai to receive Torah on Shavuot. So I love that image of like anyone ever who was or will be in this moment. Yeah. So that's like anyone who's ever converted, mm -hmm. anyone in the future who's yet to be born. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Yeah, it's incredible. I can see us there. Yeah, it's like a total <laughs> equalizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to get us from this point of enslavement and exodus, leaving an oppressive situation, even like believing that it's possible and moving on that path, like we've been talking, like charting the, the moon and the waters and then moving through this channel and then wandering. Um, from that point until this revelation of Torah and of peoplehood, we're counting, there's 49 days. So then the Kabbalists created this system of moving through the Kabbalistic tree of life throughout that 49 day period. And so it's kind of complex to describe, but it's, yeah. um, you know, it's something that more and more people are creating tools to teach folks how to do. So you move through all the different permutations of the tree of life each week for seven weeks. And when you're able to do it and really chart all of this, it's a super deep experience. And so like on one hand, you can just be like, today is the third day of the Omer. There you did it. You counted the Omer. And you can also use the opportunity to engage with Kabbalah every day, say these certain blessings. Uh, and the energy of the moment. Like, I think what's really mm -hmm. great about your deck is that you kind of synthesize what the energy of that day is and how it's relevant to our lives today. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking of the, the one sweet reparations mm -hmm. and that there's this image of all these coins releasing out of mm -hmm. a safe and that we can use this kind of renewed experience of counting the Omer to vision the world to come. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that one, the sweet reparations card is, I believe it's Tiferet Sheba Netzach, which in the system that this was a collaboration with Taya Shear. And in that system, we would call it sublime healing of collective liberation. And that's the sweet reparations card. And so there's like, and each of them are color coded and have like art that was actually created on that day of the Omer. And then it's like a little divination deck you can use throughout the year, but you can also use it like pulling a card every day of the Omer and it helps you track where you are and connect to that energy. It's yeah. really nice to have a physical tool I find card decks in that way to be really helpful. And also just the whole practice of counting the Omer to know that so many people are doing it all over the world. So mm -hmm. that we're kind of harnessing that energy each day mm -hmm. together. And preparing ourselves. It's like this soul work of kind of fine tuning all these different energies in order to be able to hear and receive big truths. And those truths are sometimes super exciting and sometimes kind of devastating and often a combination of both. And so it's allowing us to sift through all the different layers in our systems in order to be open enough to receive. I think the other thing I really love about counting the Omer 
it's about the little grains of wheat and barley and mm -hmm. the growth of them and then the collection of them to turn into bread to share with mm -hmm. everyone at Shavuot, the holiday of revelation. So again, I feel like it's really about this like deep relationship with growing things to support yeah. us and for us to have a practice of understanding that they are part of our mystical development and our mm -hmm. magical development and that this is a way that we pay reverence and that we collaborate with them mm -hmm. in the process together. Yeah. And I've seen Karina Dross, who was one of our contributors the first year that we did the planner, um, did counting of the Omer where she just put one grain of barley into a jar every day. And that was how she counted it. And I thought that was really cool. And I've seen some really cool different ways that people make little counters, like the JVP Favara made like little scrolls that are in a little box, mm -hmm. like turn them every day. And yeah, it's, it's really sweet. And it's a kind of a personal private ritual often because you would do it every day. But it's nice to have a tool that you're using because then it helps you feel connected to other people that are also doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Dream it alive. Dream it alive. Dream it the world to come. Maz, hello. Hey. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Thanks so, so, so much for having me. Thank you. So happy to see your face and your stylish glasses and your really cool microphone. Yeah, I wanted to sparkle it up today and, you know, mm. brought out these glasses. They're, They're really, really cool. They really Thank work. You. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. For well, people that are listening and not watching, Maz's glasses are big and black and then have like a lot of sparkly jewels around them. Is that accurate? That's accurate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well welcome and we're so happy to be here with you today and have you on the podcast i'm gonna read your bio to orient people to who you are mazal masood etaji they and theirs is a trans non-binary artist Arab Mizrahi Amazigh Jew, first gen, spoony, chronically ill person, herbalist, drama therapist, clown, and cultural organizer. Maz utilizes imagination, play, and ritual as tools for liberation, healing, and connection. You can find their herbal medicine apothecary at the Samin apothecary.com and the Samin apothecary on Instagram and we will put those um, links in the show notes thanks y'all oh it's so good to be here I just love chatting with you to end like dreaming the world to come we need that we really mm -hmm. need that and welcome to this season of liberation as we're moving into Nissan and into the month of Passover and the counting of the Omer. And you offered a really beautiful family ritual in the planner this year. And I'm wondering if there's anything from what you contributed that you would want to share with folks on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's the season of liberation, the best season. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I just want to say it was an honor to write that piece for Nissan because I shared about the ritual known as Psisa, which means turning. And this is a really holy home ritual, right? So for me, what I feel to share with y'all today outside of the writing that you're processing and sitting with is just that so much of what how I was raised and so much of what shapes me as a Jew and as a Mizrahi Jew is, is the home space, mm -hmm. the home ritual. And Psisa in particular is one that's so internal, right? It's something that mm -hmm. like, I didn't actually, when I was reflecting on this, I didn't even imagine I would ever really share out this in public in this way. Mm -hmm. 
And I centered the piece around my safta, my grandmother Masuda, who I'm named after. And it's so beautiful that each of us contain multitudes around our ancestors, mm -hmm. right? I really believe we carry all of them. And some kind of scream or yell or sing louder than others. And Masuda for me is that, right? And so I just want to like bring her into this space right now to bless Hi. us and have her with us, right? Like she's the one who carried this beautiful Psisa ritual, mm -hmm. you know, like after her exile from Libya, she carries this ritual with her into her small little apartment in occupied Palestine and shared that with everyone in our family, encouraged all mm -hmm. of us to do it and carry it along. And right, like I wasn't raised with her in my space all the time, right? I was raised here on Turtle Island, so-called US. She was all the way there in Palestine, like in Israel. And so I didn't, I didn't do this ritual in person with her, right? It was through my Ima, through my mother that taught me that and my aunt, my Doda on my mom's side. And so what I want to share is just this, I think it's such an honor that I, was able to share this piece publicly because I feel like she wasn't able to do so much of her magic in public. Mm -hmm. And still for me, it's frightening, honestly, mm -hmm. to do magic in public, like for so mm -hmm. many of us, right? And for me and my slew of identities and how I look, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I do think for me on a personal level, it was a huge deal to, to share this story and to write it down and for it to be in a planner, right? Like in a book form. Oh. And then on the collective level, I think for Mizuchim, it felt really powerful to have our wisdom out there in that way. And to have particularly a home, as I'm saying, like a home-based internal ritual, something that I've done it now with Ashkenazim and I've done it with folks who are not Mizrahi, but like that's new for me, right? Mm -hmm. This was usually just like a very internal blood family thing. So I think it... Mm -hmm writing this piece was so healing on so many levels. And I feel like brings her memory alive and brings my particular lineages alive in a certain way that is, was a risk to do, but feels like the risk that's necessary as we talk about liberation, right? Rooting in and down into really the fibers of who I am and sharing that with all of you, even when I'm shaking, like even mm -hmm. when I'm terrified. And even also at the same time, when I say I'm terrified, I'm also feeling so good because I'm mm -hmm. feeling so filled up. Like I feel her with us. Mm -hmm. I feel her by my side. And so that's what I want to share with y'all. And that's what I want to kind of amplify through the writing of this piece. Mm -hmm. I was trying to bring you all in into the senses, into the kitchen, because it's that mm -hmm. intimate. And so yeah. it's just a blessing. It's a bracha to like be able to be in this intimacy with you around ritual and around what Nisan actually feels in the fibers of my being, right? Like this is okay. the ritual that we do on the first of the month to welcome it in. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm wondering for folks that might not have read the planner, if there's anything of the ritual that you would be open to describing for listeners. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So in the Psisa ritual, um, it's very sensorial. We have a bowl and we make a mixture and that's known as the Psisa itself. And that's usually grain-based and oil-based. And it's said to kind of resemble the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Or rather it's said to, to symbolize the like the stuff, the glue kind of in between Mortar. what held the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what held the like tabernacle, the Mishkan together. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. That's like one of the symbols of it. So if you can imagine we're centering around a bowl with this kind of sticky, thick substance that you prepare with like barley and spices and oil. And then you put in side of the bowl to be blessed. You put in your jewelry is typical to be done. You can, I like to also say like put your amulets in there so that they get kind of this cleansing and this huge protection and blessing as we turn the season. And there's also what's involved and the main kind of movement aspect of the ritual is keys. So you have kind of these old keys that you physically turn in the mixture as you're pouring oil, as people are reciting a blessing out loud. 
Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all of that, Maz. The way you describe it and the way you wrote about it. It's mm -hmm. such a visceral. I can really feel the elements of the ritual, the richness. Yeah, that's what I love about it so much. Yeah. Like, the, I think the oil, the fat, like involving mm -hmm. all these different elements, I think really prepare us and like propel us into mm -hmm. spring in such a way. Like, mm -hmm. we need that. I don't know. I personally feel like I need that. Like, I need a stirring. I need some kind of eruption to get mm -hmm. out of that cocoon of winter. Or else mm -hmm. it's like the stagnation is there. The stuckness is there. Like, mm -hmm. the lessons that we're learning in the winter don't get moved so yeah. it's really cool that sea size is turning like, so, yeah so let's turn with it like i love the timing of it too that that it's the biblical new year the first mm -hmm. of nissan mm -hmm. and that imagery with the key is mm -hmm. like okay it's a portal mm -hmm. as you said like the turning of the season yeah yeah my experience growing up, I was steeped in Jewish community, but it was kind of split, you know, it was like multi-tiered almost, right? It was like we had our at-home keila, at-home community, which was a lot of Mizrahim. There was also like, you know, uh, couples that were like mixed Ashkenazi, Mizrahi, but like Israeli. So a lot of that energy in our homes and that shaped a lot of what I understood was Jewishness. Mm was through the food, through the feasting, through the holidays together. And it was so homey, like so much of that. I'm really grateful for my parents and like for all my friends' parents who put so much, like it didn't even feel like effort, right? I think nowadays it feels like more like effort with my bud sometimes, but it was kind of this seamless thing that happened. And, and perhaps it's because we were also neighbors. Like it was just easy. It was like a, mm -hmm. a crew of like, 15, 20 people that lived really close by. It was easy to get to each other. Like, mm -hmm. you know, also my Ima, my mother required that we be at the Friday night dinner table every Shabbat. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting, right? We were not like religious, quote unquote, like meaning we weren't Orthodox. Or like, I think a lot of Sephardi Mizrahi families fall into this category, like of Masoti mm -hmm. almost. Like we're not, we're traditional in some aspects, but totally not in others. It's this kind of middle space. And so if you give that example, it's like my ima was like, you have to be at the table Friday night. Like you have to be there eating dinner together. Right. But then it's like, right as dinner's over, the TV switches on, you know, and just this like funny combination <laughs> for her. What really was vital was like us just eating and sharing yeah. that time mm -hmm. together. together. Right. Exactly. I feel like my Jewishness was shaped through and like I relate to my Jewishness growing up through the depth of community that I had. Thank God. I'm so grateful mm -hmm. for it. And then though, there's this like other part in which, and I think a lot of Jews have this, but for me as like a first gen Mizrahi Jew here, like there is this deep feeling of otherness and deep feeling of mm -hmm. not relating to like Jewishness at large, like whatever that means. I didn't connect to like the Ashkenazi norms and stuff like that. And it wasn't just a feeling inside, right? This comes from my parents where they really didn't want us to be a part of that. Oh. Not trusting the American Jewish thing, like them not wanting to fully assimilate, mm -hmm. right? Like they really wanted to stick to their spiritual and religious practice that they knew mm -hmm. and that that felt authentic to them. Instead of trying to like blend into the Ashkin normativity and blend into like the synagogue community that was in mm -hmm. town, that was like Ashkenazi led, but there were a lot of Mizrahim who would go, right? Mm -hmm. There was a desire to be here for my parents around, quote, the American dream, definitely around mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. like and around capitalism and jobs and things like that. But they didn't want me or like any of their children to really be part of like the American Jewish dream, let's say. So I feel like mostly for me, I remember as a child feeling connected to Jewishness growing up through prayer, through mm -hmm. ritual, through cooking, through just like mm -hmm. hanging with my parents, drinking like Moroccan mint tea, nana tea, like in the kitchen, whatever. Mm -hmm. I do remember feeling a tetheredness to religiosity though, in a certain way. I just want to share a brief story and then, you know, we can move, but like around my B mitzvah time, right? I'm like 12, 13. 
And my Abba, my dad, um, he didn't let my older sister read from the Torah. And all of our peers who were not cis men were reading from the Torah. I was in mm -hmm. like more kind of conservative-ish community. And for me, I remember my time came around and I cried and begged him, please let me read from the Torah. I think it's powerful on like different levels, right? Like what I was seeing my Ashkenazi peers doing and what I wasn't doing. That's just like an interesting juxtaposition moment. And like, it's so genderful and like, there's so much there mm -hmm. that I appreciate like my little self for doing mm -hmm. and for asking mm -hmm. for. And we finally came up with a compromise where I could study one Aliyah. So like one portion. Mm -hmm. Um, of the weekly chapter of the Torah and study it and do it, but only in front of my smaller school community and not at the synagogue. So it's really interesting. interesting. It feels like somewhat relevant or, or poignant or telling of like how I carry Jewishness or how mm -hmm. it formed me and shaped me and like where I resisted against what was in my home structure mm -hmm. and where I decided to agree with what was around, mm -hmm. what my parents wanted for us. I, love I feel like your kid, yeah. your kid self who wanted to do that. <laughs> so sweet. Mm -hmm. I know it's like so telling. It feels so telling <laughs> to me. I'm like, oh, that's so me. Aww. I'm thinking about one of the first times that I met you. Well, the, actually, can I share the story of the first time I ever met you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so magical, was yeah. yeah. at an initiation ritual, and you were there as support, and so. I, I think my first time remembering interacting with you, you had a veil over your face yes. and were <laughs> holding my hand and walking with me in the dark yeah. towards this temple that was bursting with song. And I didn't know what was happening, who you were, where I was going, <laughs> and was just trusting you and holding your hand as we walked towards it. Oh, that was my, my first interaction with you. So thank story. you. <laughs> thank you. No, I don't know. It's like... <laughs> it's such a moving moment and just yeah that I was able to hold your hand like towards this initiation moment and be there for you as witness was yeah it was beyond yeah such a magical moment and being outside and mm -hmm. being like fully immersed in the woods mm -hmm. just such a special ritual you know like such a special yeah. special ritual yeah. and for anyone who's listening it's kind of a secret ritual so it's like you don't know what you're yeah getting into yeah. as you're doing it even and so that trust is really significant so thank you for feeling so instantaneously trustworthy to me um <laughs> thank you and then the next time that I s ever encountered you I believe other than that week because then I did see you with the veil right. off of your face but um yeah <laughs> <laughs> unveiled <laughs> yeah <laughs> but the next time i remember seeing you was you reading torah at oh, yes. a yom kippur service at ibrahim baba's and i feel like i had a sense that it was a significant moment for you in mm -hmm. reading torah and that you were using an ancestral trope and yeah. i wonder if you want to share if you remember that experience and want to share anything about it yeah oh my god thanks for remembering that for bringing that yeah, that was, so that was um, Yom Kippur. And yeah, I decided with Taya's support, I was like, you know, it was a certain trans coming out-ish moment for me, mm. or like a certain significant moment in my gender journey. And I wanted to mark it in a certain way. And mm. just because of the nature of the mitzvahs and whatever, and that being so gendered, you know, I wanted to do another one. And this was mm -hmm. kind of like a mini. Again, it's funny in my life, I feel like I've had two minis. And so now they're like a one hole. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I read a few um, portions in Moroccan trope that day. Mm -hmm. And that felt so special on many levels, like to do that in, you know, Kohenet, Makam Shekhina community. Um, yeah, yeah, on a special day. Mm. Yeah. I'm wondering if you want to share more about where you're at with Jewish community, Jewish identity, Jewish yeah. self. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. I feel like right now I feel much more of me 
around Jewishness. I feel like more parts of me are taking up space in my Jewishness and more parts are public and more parts are also just like showing up with my buds. And I still hold true in many ways to how I was raised, right? Like my home space is such a ritual space to me and my own practice. And then also for my community members who come and who I host and who we sit and have Shabbats together, or do different rituals together. I feel like it's such a juicy time right now. On a collective level, for Mizrahim in particular, I've done a lot of organizing with fellow Mizrahim around Palestine, around other topics around Mizrahiut, like what it even means to be us, like what even is that word, right? Like, oh my God, I'm Moroccan and Libyan, but like you're Iraqi. And how does that even, how do we smush together when this term mm -hmm. was created by Zionists, right? So it's such a big time. And I feel like mm. a big moment on multiple levels, both on the personal and the collective. I know I keep on differentiating, but I feel like it's important to say like, what's the inner world process versus mm -hmm. like, what am I externalizing though? You know, mm -hmm. what am I bringing out? I feel much less of a contradiction right now in my Jewishness. Mm -hmm. I feel like th one of the winning narratives and stories growing up was of non-belonging. And I know that that's so true for so many Jews, right? And I'm not to say, oh, I don't feel non-belonging ever. Like, of course, right? like I'm a human being, but I do feel a part of something finally, which is nice to say, like, it's nice to land there. It's so comforting. Mm -hmm. I don't always feel obviously at home in every Jewish space. No, like as a Jew of color, as a Mizrahi, as a whatever, like all these, like I don't, but I do feel like I found these sweet little pockets within mm -hmm. Jewishness at large that work for me and where I feel celebrated and where I can share my voice. And I don't feel scarcity around it anymore. Mm -hmm. I think there was enough of us yearning mm -hmm. and enough of us needing that we all were just like, oh, let's just do this together now. Let's just stop, you know, holding up or isolating and let's come out with it. And I want to say that's even a shift in the past five years for me. Like I can even recall myself at a JVP, like national convention. I think there was like, you know, the one by Joxum day, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. Like before the main huge part of the conference. Mm -hmm. But I, even in that day, I remember feeling so lost, like so very lost, mm -hmm. just not able to feel the wholeness of my organizer self, my spiritual self, my this self, my trans self, my da da, like I couldn't, everything felt so spliced, so split, so like they each needed their own room or their own shelf mm -hmm. and that they would be fighting, you know, forever. And I feel like that's like mm -hmm. something I was raised with, right? This fighting mm -hmm. feeling. Every, every part of you is kind of against itself instead of, oh no, it's actually this whole gorgeous, messy ass mural and that's you, babe. And I love you, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that, like, <laughs> so Hallelujah. Yeah, chill, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm proud to be able to say that though, that I can locate wholeness within my Jewishness. I don't know that I would have said mm. that five years, definitely not. What I, the image that I got when you were describing that was turning the key. Wow. Like, oh, I it was that. like, okay, like all the grain, yeah. all the oil, and like, so it has to be all messy in there for <laughs> it to turn. Oh, exactly. You're so right. It's so, mm. Wow. Mm. Thank you. That's mm. so true. That's the metaphor of it. Exactly. Yeah. All the different textures, all the things we thought couldn't possibly work together mm -hmm. but like of course they do right like yeah. like there and isn't another way right and i think that's yeah just processing it live with y'all right now i do mm -hmm. feel that's part of undoing my own personal and i think familial undoing of zionism colonialism like that's like if mm -hmm. we're gonna put like structural words on this mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. that is that right because mm -hmm. there's just so much separateness that was instilled in the mm -hmm. fibers of my bones, right? Um, mm -hmm. And to remember the togetherness and to trust that togetherness, right? Like, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. is a gift and is a healing, I think, from that. Mm-hmm. So beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I keep seeing like crystalline structures in my head, the way that water will absorb the energies and express them through these patterns, like a fractured fighting against itself energy gives these more kind Mm -hmm. of harsh edges internally. And then when you're able to actually be like, oh yes, all of me working together, just the ways that that blooms and grows from there. Whoa. Thank you. Thank you for that image. That's, and I relate. Yeah. That's the feeling exactly those sharp Mm -hmm. edges, but then like this Mm -hmm. beautiful thing inside that's glistening. Yeah. Yeah. This feels like a great transition to ask you, what are the ways you're dreaming the world to come? Oh my God. Okay. Can we, can we take a sec to like, for y'all, right? The world to come, right? Olam haba. For me, there's like the one that we're dreaming, co-dreaming as we're talking right now in this yeah. lifetime. That's one for me, right? But then there's like the the Olam Haba that's written about a lot in, you know, rabbinical texts and in Jewish sacred texts, right? That's like the one where we pass over, where we die. There's that one. I'm so glad you brought it this up because I don't know if we've explicitly talked about this on the podcast. Oh. We're like, okay, we're doing this world to come <laughs> Um, how i relate to it it's it's what's alive in our world that Mm. is the world we want to live in and bringing more attention to that so that the parts of our world that are harmful and hurtful and oppressive fade away become part of our living history but not our lived experience And I guess I would say in terms of what the rabbis imagined, that it's more like an afterlife kind of vision. Um, I still think that in that there's some kind of dreaming of like some kind of like perfection or, Mm. you know, oh, well, if we can't have the perfect world here on earth, like what could it be in our imagined like on the other side? And in some ways, it's like, you know, we all have ancestors that are currently living in that world, you know, who have crossed over and we're still with them. And so to Mm me, I'm like very open to whatever the interpretations are that people want to bring to the world to come, like whatever that means to you and and specifically how how we are enlivening that vision. Oh, man. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I just appreciate, yeah, I just want to pick up on this last thread, Nomi, of like perfection. When I was writing about this, like Olam Haba, about the world to come, I was like, oh, I'm so in love with imperfection. So like, Mm -hmm. what about a world (laughs) that's like messy, celebrates all Mm -hmm. the parts? Mm -hmm. What about that world? And that isn't the world that I feel we live in, right? It's such a high stakes perfectionist thing Mm -hmm. even here. So it's interesting that there's an imagining of something perfect next because I'm like, (laughs) don't we want a relief of that? Yeah. I think that they're like that. I don't, I wonder where that perfect like kind of framing Mm -hmm. came from because I don't necessarily think our ancestors when they thought of the world to come were thinking of perfection in a capitalist white supremacist way per se, because there's perfection in chaos. Right. And, and I mean, our ancestors have so much reverence for the non-human world and which is filled Mm with your so-called messy things, you know? Yes. No, it reminds me when you say this, Rebecca, like of of actually our creation story of Bereshit and of the chaos that is, that it takes to create a world, right? Hashem, right? God supposedly in this grand story does all these magical wild things that are utter chaos. When you're reading it, it's like total creation, destruction, embarrassment, <laughs> da, 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 like all at the same time, like conflict, um, 
um, non-repair, actually, some repair, like it's actually mm. everything. How can we look at that text too, to support us in dreaming our world to come? Because for me, mm -hmm. when I think dreaming the world to come, let's look down. Let's look at the roots. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what first came before us so that mm -hmm. we can more in integrity, like know and feel the path forward, you yes. know, and feel the world to come from a very rooted, rooted, rooted place. Like I'm not interested in a world to come that's individualist or like it's from my mm -hmm. own idea. I want us to mm -hmm. sit around many, many circles, many, many times, just like we are right now in seeding that together. And for me, one answer to this question is it's definitely in total congruence with the earth, with the elements, with their totality, not apart. That's like number one for me, like mm -hmm. totally not separate, totally with, like really listening well. And I think that medicine of listening well to the earth, to the elements is one I would want to bring how to feel all with you by my side. How can we do that with laughter? Like, how can we do that with a little more space, a little less grasp? How can we actually resonate <laughs> with the way a rose grows? How can mm. we physically do that side by side? How can I do that with you? Mm. Right. Um, and me and Rebecca have jammed a lot on roses and their medicine, but why I, I feel like they came through just then is because I do think they are such a potent way of, of, of relating to one another, meaning like with boundaries, but also with your full beauty by my side. Like, mm. that's what I mean. So I guess I'm giving like a, both a relational answer here and like a mm -hmm. earth-based answer here. I feel myself so nourished and embraced by your words and the energy mm -hmm. that you're imparting. It's not all the time I get to really feel that virtually in this way. And thank you. You're powerful. Thank you for drawing us in. Thanks for being here. Thank you for asking the good questions and for asking also the risky questions, mm -hmm. dreaming in general, but then dreaming the world to come. All those layers there, it's big work, you know? So Mm. I just feel grateful to stew in it with you at this very, very precious, like particular moment in history in which mm -hmm. our dreams are needed so badly. If I do want to seed one, seed two again here today with y'all, it's like, I want so much more care. <laughs> I want so many more of our needs to be met. Like so, so mm -hmm. many more mm -hmm. for all of us. Like I so deeply mm -hmm. want that. If we're talking Psisa, if we're talking that mixture, like that's part of the glue and part of the sticky mixture mm -hmm. that is actually missing mm -hmm. in all of our work, in organizers' work, in like the people we totally don't align with on the right wings. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's like literally like that care. Mm -hmm. I pray for that today. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Apple Blossom Meditation for Nissan. Take a few deep breaths. Feel the season of spring arising in you. Our holiday of Pesach comes this month. This is the new year of the Torah. And with it, we see the first buds and blooms of apple tree. From this new year, the blossoms will in time turn into the apples of our other new year, Rosh Hashanah. But for now, we get to revel in the beauty 
and scent of the apples and our reveling wakes up a sweet feeling of liberation inside of us. So take a breath into that sweet feeling of spring, freedom, spring, emergence, spring, celebration, spring heart opening. Imagine that apple blossoms completely surrounding you as if you're sitting in a comfortable perch in a big, comfortable apple tree. Feeling the energy arising, feeling the presence of beauty and let yourself know that's you. You're this energy. You're this presence. You're this arising. You're connected to the drops of water that have fallen on the petals, the stamens reaching for the stars, the bark protecting the inside waterways of the trunk of the tree, your saliva, your tears, your sweat, you're part of this springtime water blossom beauty. Welcome Nissan, welcome spring, happy new year, happy blossoming. This is this way to Olam Haba, the segment of our podcast where we talk about projects and things that are leading us into the world we want to live in more fully. And this month, we, with Passover, we want to talk about the Seder plate. The Seder plate is part of our ritual on Passover that has many symbolic tools and foods that help us tell the story of liberation. And there are traditional items like a shank bone and bitter herbs. And there are also new items that have been introduced like an olive to be in solidarity with Palestinian liberation. And an orange is about liberation from sexism. And a few years ago, a new item was introduced, which is the spoon. And as people who are disabled and think a lot about disability and disability justice, we want to introduce to you this new item that's been used on the Seder plate, the spoon, in honor of disabled people. Yeah, so in 2020, which was as most of us know, the first year of the pandemic, when a lot of us were isolated in our homes and really thinking about what the impact on disabled people of this pandemic was going to be, Elliot Kukla and Danielle Ferris proposed a spoon on the Seder plate for inclusion of disability as part of this liberation festival. And the spoon has become a little bit of a, a symbol of disability in a way, because of what we what's called spoon theory it's come to be called spoon theory um and so spoon theory is essentially it could be any item it was developed or ex first introduced by a person named christine miserandino and apologies if i'm not saying your name right christine but the idea is basically you have a set amount of energy for a day and for disabled people that might be pretty limited. And what she used to describe that was spoons. Let's say 
a disabled person has five spoons to work with throughout the day. So maybe getting up and getting dressed is one spoon. So you have to kind of measure out your energy, how much you're outputting based on how much you know you'll have for the day. So for example, right now I likely have COVID and this is probably going to be, I'm using all my spoons to do this podcast today. So when you hear people say things like, oh, I'm all out of spoons, that's what they're referring to is like the little allotment of energy that I have in my day to do things is used up. And then, so last year, our friend Jonah Aline Daniel, who runs Narrow Bridge Candles, and then um, a couple other community members, one was Mads DeShazo of Blessed Memory. She's somebody that we actually lost in the last couple of months. So it feels special to honor her with this. So Jonah and Mads, and then also Carrie Kaufman, put together a disability justice Hagata insert. And they also sent out little gold spoons to put on your Seder plate. They're really darling. Beautiful. Yeah. And they all did writings and they also included the 10 principles of disability justice by Sins Invalid. And it's really awesome. And so we'll put a link to where you can access that in our show notes. And we're visioning a world where people with disabilities, our needs are centralized and that we all practice every day being in community together and supporting and protecting the lives of people who are vulnerable or have, you know, more health risks, less energy to do things with. And also kind of just knowing that everyone has, I, in my experience, most people I know have some kind of disability and just normalizing that. (laughs) Yeah. Or they're moving towards that with age Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. with climate chaos becoming more intense. Yeah. 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 I recently had a revelation about being disabled that, you know, because our world really doesn't support disabled people in our lives Mm -hmm. that it's easy to feel like a victim sometimes. Mm. And I was, I just kind of had this statement run through me that was like, I'm not a victim. I'm someone Mm. who's impacted by a culture that doesn't want me or my disabled community to live. Mm -hmm. And that that's what we mean when we say disabled, there's Mm. nothing wrong with us that we're disabled by a culture and a society that doesn't support our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And with, you know, this global pandemic, so much of the way that it's been framed, you know, people act like it's over and say things like, well, it's just people with multiple comorbidities who are dying at this point. It's like, oh, okay. So it's disabled people, fat people, elders, cool. Okay. Those people don't matter. Like that's my community. That's, you know, really amazing people that contribute so much to the world just by existing. And we want our liberation to include everybody. I just got this image of like all these people in spoons, relaxing in spoons, lounging in spoons, flying through the air. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> like the spoon is the new broom. <laughs> yes! Spoon is the new broom! <laughs> We have a few announcements. We still have planners for sale. They're $18 and they live in the rafters of my house in a dry, warm place. And we have a Patreon, which we would welcome your support, even for a dollar a month. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who is already supporting us on Patreon. I think we have 27 or 28 patrons. Thank you. And that money goes to support producing this podcast. And thank you to Nomi Lamb, my lovely co-host, and Kim Wayman, who is our behind-the-scenes person to both of them for all their editing finesse to make this podcast. And just to give a little insight, it takes many hours to do the editing and and it's a labor of love 
and it's certainly not a, a very much paid position. <laughs> <laughs> very so. low compensation, but it's it's very rewarding, nevertheless. And we get each episode ASL interpreted, and we try to get it out as close to the release date as possible so that people that want to watch the ASL have the same access as people that are listening or just watching with captions. And sometimes it's late because of people's schedules and just figuring it out. There's a lot behind the scenes that happens to make that happen. So thank you to everyone that watches. It's part of our disability justice principles to make this as accessible as possible. And there are deaf people in our community that we want to share our work with. The most recent one was interpreted by Aaron Sanders Sigmund and Jennifer Mantle. And it's really fun when we can have two people doing it because then one of them will be me and one will be Rebecca. But sometimes it's just one person depending on who's available. And we also welcome feedback about the ASL if you have thoughts about it. Oh, 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 oh,